going. So I just want to welcome everyone to the May um, APCG online colloquium. And I really appreciate all of you being here. So really excited to have Nico Minde with us today. And we'll be discussing his paper to negotiate or not to negotiate with the FDLR rebels, President Kikwete and Tanzania's foreign policy in the Great Lakes region. Um, so Nico is a PhD candidate at the United States International University Africa in Nairobi, where he's joining us from today. Uh, Nico, thank you so much for sharing your work with us. We're also very lucky to have two phenomenal discussants with us who both conducted um, extensive field work in Tanzania. So first we have Beth Whitaker, who's an associate professor at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, and her research focuses on migration and security issues in Sub-Saharan Africa. And she was actually a Fulbright Scholar at USIU in 2005-2006. Um, we also have with us Keith Weghorst, who is an assistant professor at Vanderbilt University. And his research examines political leadership in low-income and non-democratic settings with a focus on opposition candidates. Um, I'm Alicia Perisky. I'm one of the APCG online colloquium organizers, and so I'll act as a moderator for today's discussion. Um, so we're going to start with Nico giving us a quick five-minute overview to the paper, so a brief background of what his goals are for the paper. And then Beth and then Keith will provide their comments on the paper, and we'll give Nico then a chance to respond to those comments before we open up the discussion to everyone else. So we have quite a number of people joining us today, which is fantastic. Um, I just ask that you please mute your microphones if you're not talking. And then when it comes time uh, for the open discussion, I'll open the floor for comments and, and questions. So I'll turn this over to Nico. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, thank you once again. And it is, um, I'm, it, I'm pleased um, for you to invite me to share my thoughts on my paper. Um, I actually wrote this paper a while back, but I've been juggling and trying to find uh, input so that I can be able to publish it. So the paper is titled to negotiate or not to negotiate with the FDLA rebels, uh, President Kikwete and Tanzania's foreign policy in the Great Lakes region. Um, um, Alicia has actually introduced me. I'm Nicodemus Minde. I'm a PhD student at uh, USIU. And my research interests are in um, actually in one party dominance and, uh, and elections and democratization. And I'm focusing on Tanzania, but also I've taken quite a great interest in foreign policy. And also of recent, I've been trying to uh, get a lot of interest in uh, the intersection between uh, uh, popular culture and uh, politics. And I've written quite a lot, um, a few draft papers on the same. Um, I will be very brief in terms of my uh, my remarks because I've shared my draft paper and it's very draft, it's you know very raw. Uh, the paper has, actually has a number of key. I bring a, lot, a number of key arguments. One, I want to understand uh, the actor specificness of foreign policy uh, behavior, uh, drawing empirical uh, arguments from uh, Kikwete's 2013 um, uh, proposal to Rwanda on the FDLR rebels, uh, actually it was at the side meetings of the 2013 summit in, uh, in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, where he made a preposition uh, not only to Rwanda, but also to Uganda on the prospects of uh, bringing about peace and stability within that region. And actually he made a preposition of uh, why doesn't Rwanda actually negotiate with the FDLR rebels. And this brought in a lot of uh, smart because um, it didn't go well with the Rwandan authorities and more so uh, with the President, Kik, uh, President um, um, Paul Kagame, uh, of which he took a lot of, um, you know, he said that it was, he argued that it was not into, in the right aspect for Tanzania to actually make a proposition to negotiate with rebels. And um, of course, we understand the background of the FDLR rebels within uh, that particular region and, and their role in the 1994 genocide in Rwanda. Uh, secondly, I want the paper tries to uh, ask this question, can we read foreign policy, and that is uh, Tanzania's foreign policy from Kikwete's uh, personality in, in terms of his response um, um, to the FDLA rebels uh, insurgency and um, acts of violations within that particular region. 
And I proceed uh, from that backdrop uh, by arguing and uh, looking at how um, uh, the Tanzania's foreign policy had a major shift from Magufuli when he just took office. We saw that um, in his first foreign visit, of which he doesn't make many foreign visits, um, uh, President Magufuli actually made his first foreign visit to Rwanda, which was quite intriguing for, for us students of, of foreign policy, uh, trying to understand um, you know, that foreign policy shift in terms of personality. And it was a time when Tanzania was actually embroiled with a, in a diplomatic spot between uh, itself and Rwanda. So it was quite intriguing for us as uh, foreign policy students to just uh, to look at how, why the motivations behind, uh, you know, the thawing of ties between Rwanda and Tanzania. Uh, that was just 2013, 2015 when Magufuli just became president. Uh, thirdly, the paper tries to theorize uh, foreign policy analysis, uh, which is a major subfield of international relations. Uh, and here, the paper tries to look at the individual uh, decision-making theory, drawing from the scholarship of the likes of Valerie Hudson. Um, she has written quite a lot on foreign policy behavior and decision-making theory, uh, drawing a lot from what she terms is the personality and the actor specificness of that um, uh, of that particular theory. Uh, fourthly, I look at uh, the intersection between personality and foreign policy. So I draw a number of, um, you know, literature. I do literature review on that particular subject, uh, trying to understand uh, the relationship between personality and foreign policy. Of course, that that uh, that, that area of um, is quite large. And if you're a student of foreign policy, uh, number five, I try to now make an assessment of Kikwete's proposal. Um, for Rwanda to negotiate. And this is where I draw, uh, I draw a lot of, um, I try to look at documentary analysis, especially drawing from, uh, from Kikwete speeches and how, you know, trying to draw the responses. So I try to understand, uh, to assess the proposal. Uh, and if you look at the paper, I say, uh, for example, uh, during Kikwete's response, he said that it was actually based on uh, uh, good faith that uh, it was nothing. It was nothing vindictive. It was just a matter of, um, you know, trying to offer a proposal to negotiate so that uh, there can be stability within that particular region. And we understand why Tanzania and Kikwete made this particular preposition. Why? Because Tanzania has been hosting a large number of refugees uh, from the from the neighboring um, uh, region. And this has had a lot of impact, uh, uh, Beth Whitaker, that is your subject. It has drawn a lot of impacts on Tanzania's stability, especially in terms of security and all that. So it was uh, Kikwete's uh, maybe, uh, I also look at Kikwete's background within uh, his president and also his foreign minister, trying to draw a lot on, um, on, um, on how he was able to handle different conflicts, conflicts within the region, especially the Rwanda crisis, the Kenyan political uh, violence in 2008, 2007, and other major engagements. And lastly, I tried to draw a, a nexus between personality and national characteristics. And here, uh, uh, if you look at the literature around foreign policy and foreign policy analysis, we look at, we see that there's a number of, uh, there's that, um, a nexus between a national character. And if you look at Tanzania's foreign policy as a vague within the paper, is likely driven by personality and also the legacy um, that surrounds uh, the legacy that surrounds the country in terms of its history in liberation and all that. So could this have actually informed uh, Kikwete's, um, uh, Kikwete's preposition? These are some of the uh, uh, points that I, I put forward. And in, in conclusion, I make an argument that indeed, uh, drawing from the vast literature of foreign policy, looking at it from the personalized aspect. Uh, uh, so I make, a, I make some, um, some sort of um, correlation between personality, national character, uh, by actually trying to contextualize the Rwanda-Tanzania uh, uh, diplomatic spat that began in 2013. Um, and uh, you can say somehow ended in 2015, but uh, there's still some sort of Cold War rivalry between the two countries. And that is just my presentation in brief. Great. Thank you so much for that, Nico. I really appreciate that. Beth, we'll turn to, to your comments. Great. Uh, thanks, Nico. And thanks, Alicia, for inviting me to do this. Um, as we were talking about before everybody came on, I was uh, 
really excited for this, both because what you mentioned in terms of having done my dissertation research on refugee issues in Tanzania um, a long time ago <laughs> in the 90s, and uh, but then also because I spent a year at, at USIU, uh, where Nico is now sitting, uh, and uh, I may have even taught in that classroom. I'm not sure. So, <laughs> so, um, so it's uh, it's good to make these uh, make these connections and such. So. Um, so I'm going to try to, I, I really enjoyed reading uh, the paper and I think Nico has given a good overview uh, here. Um, it's really, you know, sort of focused on this proposal that Kikwete made in, in 2013 for Rwanda to negotiate with the FDLR uh, rebels and, and uh, uh, he did not mention the reaction from Kagame, but uh, Kagame's reaction, uh, Kagame basically threatened to wait for Kikwete at the right place and hit him. Uh, so clearly this did not go over well. Uh, and uh, and so, so Nico uses this story as a way of sort of examining foreign policy and highlighting the role of the individual, in this case, uh, Kikwete in the foreign policy making uh, process. And uh, so what I wanted to do is talk about a few strengths of the paper and then a few areas of improvement. Uh, and Nico, I have written this all up and I'll send this to you via email. So um, so don't feel like you have to scribble down every, every word I say. Um, so, um, um, but in terms of strengths, so first off, I will say I really like the emphasis on international relations in, within Africa. Um, it, you know, this draws relation, draws attention to relations between African states, which is a topic that I think has received not sufficient attention uh, in the study of African politics. Um, this is an APCG forum, and as I, much as I love reading my APCG colleagues' work on uh, democratization processes in Africa, um, I, I think there's a need for more work on the ways in which African states and peoples interact uh, with one another. This is also a an opportunity for a shameless plug for my book with John Clark on Africa's international relations. Um, and uh, But again, that's just um, a perspective I think that we need to be paying attention to international relations within Africa as, rel as well as uh, you know, domestic politics in many countries, though I would argue those are related and I'll come back to that later. Um, a second strength is the application of the IR literature uh, to the African context. Um, so in the paper, um, and I'm, I'm assuming everybody had the opportunity to read it, but Nico draws on, on literature uh, in the field of international relations, especially foreign policy analysis, and applies it to uh, the Tanzanian, you know, Tanzanian Rwandan uh, relations. Uh, and I think this is really important because too often as, as regional specialists, we often sort of neglect to look at literature from beyond our region uh, and, and fail to make those connections. And, uh, and so I think it's really nice the way he seeks to put African foreign policy decision making uh, within a broader uh, global context. And then just finally, a little thing I wanted to mention, I really like that Kagame is like a secondary role in here, because I think a lot of people, when they look at anything involving Rwanda, um, Kagame gets this larger than life role in everything, and, and uh, you know, sort of is seen as, as the manipulating everything in the region. And, and this is really focused on Tanzanians' perspective and, and Kikwete's perspective, uh, and, and, and Kagame is just a supporting actor. And, and so I think that's, uh, that's uh, a really good, uh, good uh, trait here. Um, there's a lot of richness in this, and I just want to talk about a few things that I think, ways I think, Nico, that you could sort of improve on, on what you have here uh, and help the argument come out a little bit more uh, for the, the reader. Um, so the first area I want to talk about is sort of on theory and concepts. Um, you actually emphasized it a little bit more in your when you just were outlining it here, but, but the sort of actor specificness of foreign policy uh, behavior. Um, I think you know many political scientists do focus more on sort of structures and interests, but it's hard to look at somebody like Kagame or, or Donald Trump, for example, and suggest that an individual leader doesn't have some role, right? Doesn't make some uh, difference. I think what confused me early in the paper is the term personality. Um, and because I tend to think of personality as, you know, sort of um, how funny you are or how you interact with other people. Um, and then it becomes clear when you get to the definition on page 11 that, that personality is all of that and more. I mean, because it was early in the paper, I think what you're mainly talking about is ideological beliefs. Um, but that doesn't, I don't tend to think of that as being associated with personality, but then it becomes clear that you're using a very broad definition of personality that does include ideological beliefs. So I think that needs to be moved much earlier and clarified. Um, I, but then I also sort of think that, so, I mean, I think the art main argument you're making then is that, um, that Kikwete's broadly defined personality, including ideological beliefs and everything, um, um, sort of 
um, is part of what leads to him to make this proposal, and particularly um, this his experience as foreign minister in the 1990s, um, which sort of necessitated, because of what was going on in the region, him to be involved in a lot of mediation processes. So he developed sort of a familiarity with that, and that's part of what leads to um, this proposal in 2013. And I think that's reasonable, but needs to be more, uh, more clearly articulated uh, within the paper. Um, it's also not entirely clear to me um, sort of how one measures someone's personality, not necessarily quantitatively, but how, you know, what factors are we looking at to assess personality um, and how could we disprove the hypothesis that, uh, you know, is, is this not falsifiable basically? How could we disprove the hypothesis that a leader's personality influences foreign policy decisions? Related to this is a sort of second area of, I think, improvement um, that could be made, and that is um, th there needs to be more exploration of alternative explanations. Um, I think it's it's very hard to buy the argument that this is driven by, uh, and that you say President Kikwete's proposition was largely driven by his personality. It's really hard to buy that, um, in part because sprinkled throughout, you talk about various other possible explanations for what happened, including, um, Tanzania's interests. Uh, and uh, and so let me talk first about interests, but I'll also mention a few others. I mean, the, it's clear that Tanzania has interest in seeing the, a resolution to the conflict between Rwanda and the FDLR, um, not the least of which, as you mentioned in the paper, um, it, and as you mentioned in the presentation, is the presence of, of refugees um, from both Rwanda and DRC for more than two, uh, two decades. This is, of course, also why Tanzania was involved in mediation processes in the 1990s when Kikwete was, was foreign minister. Um, and uh, so, um, so I, think, I think the interests need to be distinguished from personality or somehow, I mean, because that seems to be an alternative explanation, which has a lot of value in understanding what Kikwete did. Another uh, factor is power relations within the region, but also more broadly outside uh, of the region, uh, including with China and the United States. Some people have speculated that, uh, you know, at around this time, Tanzania was sort of competing um, with Rwanda for international attention. There's some evidence that Kagame was not particularly happy when Obama visited uh, visited Tanzania uh, just a few months after this proposal in, in, in July of, of 2013. Um, so tensions between Rwanda and Tanzania may have less to do with sort of this specific incident uh, than with broader power uh, rivalries and interest sort of attention rivalries in the in the broader scheme of of uh, international relations. Uh, Alicia, how am I doing on time? About five minutes? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so another uh, alternative explanation, it seems to me, again, one that you allude to in the paper is the sort of historical um, you know, there, there's long been complicated relations between Tanzania and Rwanda. This is not something uh, totally new. Uh, and uh, indeed, I saw this in my work in, in the 1990s in Tanzania. Various government officials told me that Rwanda effectively threatened to attack uh, uh, Tanzania, attack the camps in Tanzania as they had done in uh, in uh, Zaire if, uh, if Tanzania didn't clear them out, which they then did in December 96, as I watched. Uh, and, um, and so there's, there's a historical, it's not, you know, the, this tension between them is not uh, new under, under Kikwete. Um, there's a sort of, I don't know if you would describe this as cultural, but, the, but you mentioned in the paper Tanzania's longstanding emphasis on peace, which I think is really important. And this is something um, that has been prioritized internally and externally. Um, the CCM has sort of repeatedly used this like, okay, we may not be rich, but we're peaceful uh, sort of strategy. Uh, and, um, and I think that that's something, again, that's not unique to Kikwete and his personality, but is sort of a longstanding um, emphasis on which he may be drawing when he suggests that Rwanda should negotiate uh, with the rebels. Um, but perhaps most interesting, and I think needs most exploration, is, is the domestic political situation uh, within, Tanzan within Tanzania. Um, you know, in, in our book, John Clark and I argue um, that, that foreign policy making in, in African countries, and I would argue elsewhere in the world as well, is often informed um, and motivated by uh, domestic political calculations, uh, and including the desire to, you know, to stay in power. And certainly if you look at Kagame's relations, uh, with neighboring countries. He's often sort of played up these rivalries with neighbors like Museveni and others as a way of generating some support uh, internally. Now, obviously, Kikwete in 2013 is not facing re-election. Um, he's in his second term, um, but there is, you know, the CCM is running for, you know, wanting to maintain
in power in 2015. So I'd be really curious to see a lot more explanation of sort of what's going on. I mean, you even mentioned that your focus of your research is one party dominance, right? And, uh, and so I'd love to see who is his audience as he's doing this? Is it really Kagame or is it people within Tanzania? And is there, you know, what's going on there? And I'd love to see that teased out more here because I think that would be fascinating. Um, and so I think the, the broader point is that is sort of that you need to consider these alternative explanations because it's only if these alternative explanations don't work that you can definitively say, okay, it's a personality thing, right? But I think there's a lot there in some of these alternative explanations and I'd encourage you to explore it. I wanna be short with the other comments. I have more detailed um, notes to send you, um, but I do think there, there needs to be a bit more evidence uh, in here. You know, for example, um, you talked about how um, you talk about how Kikwete said that this was goodwill, um, that he did, you know, didn't mean anything bad about it. And you sort of affirm that you know, this was not made in bad faith with an intention to disrupt um, anything like that. But I think you need to dig into that more and get more evidence to support uh, that type of claim. I'm not sure Kikwete getting on TV and saying it was goodwill is sort of sufficient to, to be able to just say, oh yeah, I trust his word for this. <laughs> um, and there's a few other examples of just sort of providing more evidence, maybe from interviews, maybe from speeches, things like that to really support what you're saying. I think organizationally, um, it would help to start the paper with the story that you're talking about, like sort of give more, like the details of that story don't really come out with Piquete's proposal. That doesn't really come until page eight, I think. And then sort of Rwanda's reaction doesn't come till even later. And I think if you wanna set it up as this is the puzzle you're trying to understand, it would help to have that in the beginning uh, and then maybe go into the uh, lit review and, and then come back to the different explanations and sort of examine them systematically. Um, my last uh, point is just, so what? Um, it's sort of, um, there are those of us uh, who are really interested in Rwanda's relations with Tanzania and vice versa, right? Um, but that's a limited audience. And to get this published, you wanna have a, a broader audience. So, so it's sort of, of what is this a case? What can we learn from this case of, of, of Tanzania, Rwandan relations and foreign policy making that helps us better understand foreign policy decision making elsewhere in Africa and, and, and beyond. Um, and so I think, you know, as I started, I said that one of the real strengths of this paper is drawing on that broader IR literature um, and, 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 you know, applying it to this case. Do the reverse then, sort of how, what do we learn from this case that then how does, what's the contribution to that broader literature? Uh, and, uh, and, and you may want to hint at that at the introduction and then really hit it home in the, in the conclusion. But I think that's what's going to make the paper stronger, it, more than just sort of an examination of this particular incident, um, but instead sort of making that contribution to, uh, you know, sort of how this fits more broadly when we think about foreign policy decision making uh, in, in the region and, and globally. So I will stop there because I know I'm sure other people have lots of comments and questions and I'm interested, I'm curious to hear what, uh, what Keith has to say. So thanks, Nico, for a great paper. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Beth. I'll turn it over to you, Keith. Thanks. Great. Thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, super excited to be able to read this paper and comment on it a little bit. Um, and I'm just going to read my remarks. So I think that'll keep me like a little bit more focused on on time. So um, I'll just dig in. Uh, so I really enjoyed reading this paper, sort of a focus on Tanzania's foreign policy and making sense of it through the lens of a particularly important event and a particularly important uh, a person. And this is sort of his, his sort of actor-centered um, framework I really like. Uh, there's some things I really love about this paper, a little bit like I think uh, Beth said, we've gone a really long time without taking the international relations of African countries very seriously and sort of exoticized them and said like, whatever these Western frameworks about how countries do what they do, somehow they aren't applicable in Sub-Saharan Africa. So th I think that's a really, um, really great uh, 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 thing that this paper does. Um, as a caveat, IR is not really my background, so I think my comments are going to be actually uh, more like a bridge builder approach where you're sort of integrating some comparative politics concepts that I think 
provide an important sort of structure for thinking about what leaders are doing. Um, um, so it, it might be like masquerading as IR related feedback, but it's probably more from the comparative politics tradition, just as a, a caveat. Um, my comments kind of fall into three general points, although there's there's liberal subheadings, so that also might be a little uh, misleading. I'll send these to you um, after we're done. Uh, so my first comment is like big picture framing stuff. Um, and like I'm, as I'm reading the paper, what I'm writing down, it's like, well, you know, instead of what you do, you should do this instead. And you actually do end up doing that thing just sort of a little bit later on in the paper. Um, and so I, I want to look for a narrative, um, this particular narrative, and maybe consider weaving it all the way through. And that's pitching this as a bigger puzzle. That is, um, you convey the papers about a specific foreign policy decision, Tanzanians in Tanzania's recent history, but it's really a broader reflection on sort of the arc of Tanzanian foreign policy um, and tries to situate this particular event in a broader flow of this history. Uh, and so I think this is a very good thing um, in that uh, that kind of uh, a goal makes the paper bigger, makes it more important and more broadly impactful as a piece of scholarship. So like um, that kind of thing that I was looking for, you start to do it around page nine or 10 in the paper where we're kind of looking at um, Kikwete's actions sort of situate on the, again, this broad arc of Tanzania's foreign policy. Um, <clears throat> through a deep engagement with this specific event. So this, um, to me, then begs a bigger question about sort of how the specific event fits. Um, and so uh, Nico notes that Tanzania's foreign policy is characterized by, I think, as sort of having two subtypes or two eras. Um, there's kind of Nerere and then what happens after Nerere, right? So Ruxa under Mwini, privatiz privatization, anti-corruption under Mkapa, and then sort of international regional expansion under Kikwete. So in some sense, what Kikwete is doing is an extension of this. Um, <clears throat> it's one way of thinking about the event. So uh, at the same time we open the paper, we're also reflecting a little bit on like Magafuli and how this fits in that arc. And I think that's a hook that might kind of work for this paper, right? And so in some sense, uh, Magafuli's framing, like a lot of populist leaders, is more like Nerere than his predecessors, um, maybe for different reasons, but nonetheless sort of focused internal, focused on regional uh, aspects rather than and sort of uh, those folks in those other continents uh, as enemies rather than allies in some sense. Um, and then so that helps you make sense of where this moment in your paper fits in that arc. So uh, maybe thinking of it as, my sense is you might think of it as a last gasp of sort of the old new way, or the New, the old new way um, of doing things before like a shift to retreating inward. And again, I think that might be a hook that would kind of work. Um, <clears throat> and then also I think, um, you know, sort of uh, Beth brought up this interesting point about the complexity of the relationships with Rwanda. You're also seeing a shift with Rwanda. Maybe that's also for different reasons, right? Maybe Michael Foley is hanging out with Kagame because they're training TIS and, and he's like co-opting cybersecurity and those kinds of things. Just a different kind of relationship. And so this is kind of the iconic shift of an inter, international relationship uh, taking place with this is the last minute of that. Okay, um, so the second general point is uh, working more on the argument about the role of Kikwete himself and um, <clears throat> for uh, really digging in deeper again this maybe echoes something Beth was saying about about specifically personality and decision-making framework that he's using as the causal factor here right and so um, I'd like to see more evidence of this sort of broader argument um, so I was thinking like in a former life when I was the master's student um, and Kappa had these like monthly addresses that he gave that were compiled into text in the books um, and you could actually do text analysis of these speeches and sort of look for shifts in speaking style, sort of personality attributes that came through in the speeches as well as content. And I'm wondering if you could do something similar with public statements that Kikwete is making about foreign policy decisions. So if I understand the argument, um, not a ton should be changing about Kikwete's personality uh, itself, at least within perhaps constrained by the second term. So in this way, we should see that personality factor show up in other stuff too. Right, um, and so perhaps other sort of foreign policy decisions he's making at the time. So I was thinking, could you look for public statements that he makes about other foreign policy matters during his um, second uh, during his uh, presidency, like the Lake Nyasa spat that's happening with Malawi, perhaps, or like um, whose water it is, a third party, you know, sort of broker with these ongoing scuttles between Kenya and Uganda. 
uh, or posturing over Lake uh, Victoria uh, related to Burundian refugee issues uh, that, you know, these folks at Magafuli is kind of now kicking out. Like, are there other places where you can look for similar kinds of evidence? Because it's not clear to me that this specific event, if what's driving it is Kikwete's personality, why it should be different than other sort of um, uh, a challenge that he's faced. Um, I'd also encourage you to dig more perhaps more descriptively, really into the personality of Kikwete. So some of the work I think you're drawing in has much more kind of analytical, you know, psych, psych, psychology frameworks for thinking about personality um, in terms of various attributes, you know, again, these things that psychologists would do experiments in the lab about perhaps. Um, I'm definitely not suggesting you do this, but I was thinking um, at least you could dig in a little bit more on, you know, bio pieces on Kekwete um, to get some more traction on like what exactly are the underlying personality attributes that you're looking or you think are doing the work here, right? Because that lets us look in other leaders and see, oh, do they have those attributes too? In similar circumstances, would, would they make those um, decisions? So I know there's a, um, there's a book by uh, Julius Nyangaro um, who came out a few years ago that was like, it's a pretty good, like I, I've, uh, I'd recommend it. Like, I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's um, a, kind of a nice like deep dive on his like upbringing and his early stages as defense minister. And it's more of like a personal take. Uh, I can't remember what the name of it is because it's in my office, which I can't access right now. <laughs> uh, but I, I think I must have the citation for it somewhere. Um, <clears throat> and then a little bit related to that, I was just thinking, um, you know, how much of maybe what's going on is Kikwete trying to do legacy building, which I think is a little bit kind of the, the underlying point you may be trying to make, right? So he's saying, you know, his legacy of having worked in his, as a defense minister, being engaged with um, international relations with Rwanda before, this is sort of, in a way, uh, a completion of that kind of work or a continued engagement for that kind of work. Um, and uh, perhaps related to the, this being legacy building, like how on earth did he get this so wrong, <laughs> right? So like, it's somehow, I'm not sure if I'm in Kikwete shoes, I would have expected this to go like all that differently than it did, right? So suggesting that, um, you know, sort of, uh, uh, again, like peace negotiations with, uh, you know, uh, folks who engaged with in genocide, like it just doesn't seem to like, it's, this seems like a very uh, possible outcome when, when uh, at least to me, like that I should have expected given the experience that I had. So anyway, um, so uh, I thought, well, then why, why did it make sense for him to do this? Uh, you, you note, for example, uh, he played an important role in the development of the EAC, uh, particularly in the second term, so that, uh, and also in peace initiatives. So perhaps this was an effort to like legacy build on writing out a stronger regional uh, community to kind of finish off that legacy. Um, <clears throat> uh, Okay. Yeah. Right. So again, also thinking like it, this to me at least seems like a, a like a, a misstep that should have been calculable in a way. So um, just kind of trying to highlight that maybe again as it as it ties into sort of broader goals. I was also thinking maybe the reason to be looking for sort of regional or international legacy building is because a lot of the sort of domestic legacy building things going on at this time seem to be going awry. Right. So this is this is when the people's constitution is. <laughs> Uh, being solicited domestically, and it looks like the possibility of his domestic legacy is starting to break the union. Um, and so like that sort of capstone constitutional outcome is not going to be a legacy that he can take home. And so puts extra gravity, maybe makes a riskier move on looking, um, on, again, focusing on international regional, regional legacy. Okay, um, the last, this is definitely a squarely comparative politics kind of uh, suggestion, so feel free to ignore it, but I think this also ties into some of the stuff um, that, uh, that Beth was suggesting. I want to situate this paper a little bit more in the logic of electoral authoritarian regimes. Um, and the way I'm thinking about this is that, yes, Kikwete's personality and decision-making are key to the outcome you're interested in, um, but there are also meaningful, like, environmental constraints, uh, basically, like, hand-tying his decision-making power um, that, that are also shaping his decision. And I'm thinking about this at two levels. First, the sort of engagement at the level of the regime, of an electoral authoritarian regime, and uh, more critically, at the party level. Uh, so uh, just as a clarification by electoral authoritarian regimes, right, so I'm talking about regimes that hold uh, de jure competitive elections but are not meaningfully competitive um, de facto, right, so the opposition can win some seats but doesn't really have much of a chance. Um, and I think if we go back and look at the foundational work from comparative politics from the mid-20th century, one of the things that um, these folks like Lynn's, you know, said, like is identifying is we tend to think of authoritarian leaders as these kind of 
batshit wild cards, but actually, you know, they act in a way that makes a lot of sense, right? They're sort of calculating and acting strategically. This actually helps you in a way because you're talking about the personality of a leader in a sort of calculated strategic decision-making framework. Um, and so that's one reason I, I think that like drawing on that from a regi regime level might help you kind of uh, make sense of how personality and leadership decision-making can fit in this kind of broader context. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, so I just thought it's worth contextualizing Tanzania in this framework, especially because there is some work on electoral authoritarianism and uh, international relations. So I'm thinking about the Levitsky and Way stuff, and they're mostly focused on the relationship between sort of non-Western um, uh, authoritarian regimes with sort of Western uh, countries and these concepts of linkage and leverage. Um, so they're mostly concerned about foreign affairs versus, say, other rival powers, but it might really be helpful nonetheless to kind of help make sense of uh, the specific uh, uh, event that you focus on because it absolutely operates in the background of this longer term arc of foreign policy of Tanzania, right? So again, the sort of Nerere's engagement with the West and uh, or not and so on. Um, and so uh, here I'll also plug this more in a minute, but, but uh, Jonathan Morse is, um, is a really detailed engagement on sort of IR foreign relations concepts as they tie into authoritarianism. Tanzania is one of the uh, is I think in many ways the featured case of that book. Um, so there might be some stuff uh, worth looking at there. Uh, yeah, but then uh, so also thinking about electoral authoritarian regimes and political parties in general at this point uh, and how it might sort of tie back into uh, how you're thinking about um, uh, uh, decision making and leadership personality or capacity to make decisions. And uh, for Tanzania in particular, to what extent is the action of a leader attributable to that leader and that leader alone? Um, so, uh, in other words, is this decision an outcome driven by a president's decision or a decision of the party of the president, which includes the president's input and also other rival actors operating in the scene? Um, and I think because you're using this sort of rational actor way of thinking about um, decision making, this might present some more kind of theoretical issues. Um, because decision making at that level of the presidency, particularly in its timing, seems like it might be fraught with some internal rivalry and some other things that could con constrain Kikwete, right? So this is like 2013 of a lame duck presidency. Um, uh, so you know, for example, that like uh, Memba takes a position back in the present in the paper, but like even he is playing his own game at this point, right? Um, so um, my general point here is I think it's fair to argue that Kikwete is making foreign policy decisions driven by his uh, own motivation, but also thinking a little bit about the constraints that he faces uh, in terms of uh, policy decisions and in a way that he's more constrained than, you know, Museveni or Kagame or someone like that that don't have the sort of stronger party check um, uh, that exists, right? So he sits at, Kikwete is on top of a well-organized strong party with lots of internal rivals. Again, a uh, big plug for Jonathan Morse's book on this. Um, uh, uh, talking a little bit about how the party structures um, been useful in this uh, in, in constraining different actors, the decision making, and that's part of its long uh, longevity. I think just as somebody work on Tanzania, this is a common thing that comes up uh, when you present the work. They're like, "Oh, but you know, Tanzania is an odd bird because it's got that party, and so like he's got to listen to what the party said, or she has to listen to what the party said." And so, just something I suspect when you send this off for peer review, people might raise. Um, <clears throat> okay. Right, so lame duck thing. I, I assume I'm running out of time. Three more minutes. Okay, yeah. Uh, no, I So I developed an elaborate metaphor about wedding uh, IR and comparative politics literature compared to the stuffing that you put in a samosa or a sambusa, um, but I think I'll just discard that. Um, and uh, you, you can see it in the email, laugh about that later. Uh, but the result of that is thinking about putting strange toppings like mango and rice and spinach in a sambusa might be good, but probably not what your consumer is looking for. So yeah, we'll talk more about that later. Thanks. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Keith. And Nico, we'll give you a few minutes to kind of respond as you want um, or raise questions if you have specific questions for the discussants, um, or if you prefer, we can open it up more broadly to, to questions completely up to you at this point. Uh, thank you, Hans. I just want to thank you, uh, the discussants. These are very good points. Um, both of them and there are so, some sort of intersections between uh, their points. Uh, one thing that I want to just uh, mention, which I think uh, Beth uh, raises was um, the 2013, um, this was the, and why member the domestic issues, which I think is something I think I should really put into, into, into perspective. 
I will later realize that um, there was rumor that Membe was actually the preferred candidate for Kikwete going into the 2015 elections. Maybe this, these are some of the things that I need to, to demonstrate. And this is what really, it really captured my attention when you were speaking about that. And also it explains that, um, uh, what I call, um, you know, that rapid transition or, um, you know, that discernible shift. And why Magufuli, you see this, Magufuli was this like a compromise candidate or something like that. So this actually maybe explains. And of course, there was a time I actually had uh, a chance to interview the ambassador, the Rwandan ambassador to Tanzania, and he had to mention that that there could be some, this is something I also wanted to hear, how I'm going to put it uh, in the paper. There was, uh, he actually mentioned this to me in private, that there could be a possibility that Tanzania was harboring some, um, you know, remnants of FDLR in Tanzania. So those are some of these political discourses, which I think, um, could actually have informed that uh, diplomatic spot. As of course, as you pointed out, it is also very much based on a historical. Um, uh, it's you know you can actually place a lot of you know, analyze it from a historical perspective. Uh, thank you again, uh, Keith. Um, you know the points that you mentioned. Um, my thesis is actually on the same of uh, on the on the issue of uh, or competitive authoritarianism, trying to draw this with, together with the one-party dominance and. The literature that you have just mentioned, or Levit and Way, and, and many other of these uh, lecture, um, scholars, is something that I'm actually engaging in. Maybe this was an opportunity for us, maybe even to discuss my my other uh, my dissertation further. So I thank you guys, and I'm looking forward to more engagement from from the rest. Thanks, Nico. Um, so I would like to open up if anyone has any questions. For Nico. Uh, hi, uh, this is David. Uh, can I ask you a question, please? Go ahead. Great. Uh, great. Uh, Nico, thanks for the paper. Um, I'm from your neighbor, Kenya. So I'm out here in New York. So very excited. Karibu Buana. <laughs> and um, just a couple points. You know, I enjoyed reading your paper. Um, I sometimes got lost within the paper between this uh, the IR framing versus the foreign policy framing. And he seemed to double between the two. And as I read through the paper, it seemed more to be, rather than a foreign policy making paper, it seemed to be more like um, a decision making, your debate about this decision making process and the individual within that construct, right? So um, uh, discussive narratives around, uh, around foreign policy making. So might you think about reframing a lot of what you've said within a framework of uh, cognition and a lot of the literature around cognition and decision making in relation to that. And some of the other elements you could add to the paper, Nico, might be some of the literature around um, the foreign policy making of the global south broadly, some of the work of Brave Boy, uh, Brave Boy Wagner, Escuda's work on peripheral realism, um, Cassell's uh, work on um, politics of the global south, uh, Mazuri's work, of course, um, and a lot of the scholars from the global south, Guillermo O'Donnell. And then secondly, and in conclusion, um, might this, you know, there's a part of your paper where you have a, a reference to Nzomo's um, literature and previous scholars' literature about this binary discu uh, discussion of foreign policy legacies, the Mwalimu era and the post-Mwalimu era. And there have been um, several presidents post Nyerere. Um, there have been four others since Nyerere. And I, that, that narrative seems somewhat simplistic to say that there's a Nyerere and all these other four presidents after him have not had a different nuance in terms of foreign policy thinking. And that may be the case, but maybe could you unpack that further? Is it a case of, say, the CCM being a dominant party? And I'd refer you to the work of Beatrice Magaloni, um, voting for autocracy, and her argument about the pre in Mexico and how uh, the legacies of the institutional and the party shape uh, Mexican politics in terms of the domestic politics, and maybe correlate that to Tanzania. CCM is the dominant party. Is there a narrative there? And to what Beth was saying, that, right, Putnam's double-level argument, 
might this be one of the domestic elements that shaped Tanzanian foreign policy in this unique way? The, the legacy of CCM and the de facto narrative that, you know, that that creates in terms of foreign policy, foreign policy discussions. Thank you. Thanks so much, David. Those are excellent comments. Um, I, I see that Andy Marshall also has a question. So we'll take Andy's question and then give you a chance to respond to those two questions, Nico. Go ahead, Andy. All right. Yeah. Thanks so much for organizing, Alicia. And thanks for your great paper, uh, Nico. Uh, I guess my comments build really on what um, the discussions brought up. Uh, one of the things I was wondering about is the, the EAC itself um, not only like Keith had mentioned as, you know, possibly the motivating one of the, this regional background being a motivating factor for Kikwete's um, decision personally, but also to what extent did the increased interaction between Rwanda and Tanzania within the EAC, um, you know, the decision to add Rwanda and Rwanda to join the EAC, um, the annual summits, these kind of things. Um, to what extent did these constraints and other multilateral for a kind of change or not change, apparently, the behavior between um, Tanzania and Rwanda? Um, or maybe, and maybe this goes into the calculation question, is that one reason maybe why Kikwete miscalculated? That maybe he thought all of this multilateralism had changed things um, in a way that it hadn't. Um, and then that just goes to my, my other point which is this question of, you know, did, did Kikwete as a rational actor, if we view it that way, miscalculate in making this offer? And I think this also goes to, to Beth's point as well. It depends on who is his audience, right? So maybe, because Kikwete has all his experience in foreign policy and things, maybe he didn't, maybe he wasn't blind to the possibility of Rwanda reacting the way Rwanda did, um, but that that interaction was valuable for him um, in Tanzanian domestic politics or even in signaling to other international actors to make him appear um, as, as an honest broker, um, which did lead just to one smaller factual question in the same line. You talked about uh, Rwanda's reaction to the, to the suggestion. Is there any evidence or record of FDLR's reaction um, to to the suggestion? And is there any evidence from Kikwete's um, earlier experience that he had contact with FDLR? Um, maybe like the Rwandan ambassador has suggested to you, or even with Kikwete's long experience at high level politics, maybe with people who went on to be leaders of FDLR, but that Kikwete had met before the genocide? I, I, I don't know, but I would be interested in at least hearing um, about that side of it as well. Uh, but thanks for a great paper. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, David, and thank you, Andy, for those uh, good points. Uh, I'll begin uh, just to quickly to respond to uh, David's um, 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 suggestion that I should draw mostly uh, from the literature around cognition. And if you look at the foreign policy analysis um, as a discipline, actually, it draws a lot of, um, you know, um, a lot from the cognition uh, theory. Uh, if you look at the works of uh, um, Derun and um, uh, and other scholars, they actually draw a lot of similarities between, of course, cognition, psychology, perception, and misperceptions. So there's that there's that linkage. And of course, there's you know when you're looking at foreign policy, um, uh, there's one professor of mine who told me international relations is largely uh, foreign policy. So there's that. You know, the two go together. You cannot separate them. I don't know what Beth has to say about that because that's an area as well. Uh, of course, there is also the need for me to look at other literature, as you have suggested, especially the peripheral uh, realism and other linkages. On, uh, I also agree to some extent. Uh, there's maybe there's a simplification of um, the framing of Tanzania's foreign policy between these two. Uh, these two dimension, either from the Nyerere uh, legacy and the post Nyerere. Uh, well, maybe that could be true because, again, of the strength of the party. Again, looking at um, that Tanzania has, for uh, you know, since its in, uh, its independence has been ruled by one party, maybe could that be informing uh, this narrative of um, you know looking at it from that uh, those two uh, dichotomies. Maybe, um, of course, uh, again. 
there's something that is coming again uh, from your, um, your suggestion. Again, this is also similar to what Keith has proposed. Again, it, there's also that you cannot study Tanzania without looking at the centrality of the CCM party's dominance. And of course, the, the literature by Beatrice Mazzaloni is something that uh, I know Keith has also, if you look at that in terms of, um, of course, of course, we also have uh, Kenneth Green looking at Mexico's pre-party and all that. Uh, well, uh, looking at uh, the, the, the comments by Andy Marshall, um, there's something, uh, Tanzania's general position within the East African community is something that is very interesting and the pronouncement that it makes. And um, uh, of course, we, we, have been, we have seen that even with the, the current uh, COVID crisis. Uh, Tanzania's position within that within the region is something that is, uh, as we know, it's very murky and um, it is interesting. Let me just say that, and it's also in, it's important. Maybe we I could also maybe factor that in terms of my analysis, albeit it may be very you know like um, I should not I didn't want to emphasize on that. That I think that it can be another separate paper altogether. But I think it is interesting if I can also look at that vis-a-vis -vis Tanzania's um, position in, especially this was the time when after that Tanzania became was uh, secluded from the, 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 from the other partners together with Burundi, what, what they termed as the coalition of the wheeling and all that. So that also fr that tries to bring in into the issue of Tanzania relations with Rwanda. Uh, I've not thought about uh, what FDLR would have responded because for me, I feel like it's still a faceless uh, organization, uh, very abstract in its uh, organization. So I don't know, and maybe I'll be assisted by Beth um, on how I can respond to that. But I find maybe that could be something um, uh, that I can also look at. Um, something else. Uh, uh, I also thought when you were just speaking about maybe was there, could there have been also in addition to the points raised by Keith and Beth uh, about personality clashes between these two leaders, uh, strong, um, the strong personality clashes between Kikwet and uh, Kagame, again in light of uh, international, um, the international political discourses at that time when you know, both countries are trying to fight for international recognition and you know, traction. Maybe so something that I might also try to uh, factor in when I'm revising the paper. Thank you again, Andy and uh, David. Thank you. Um, we do have another question here from Megan Garrity. You can... Thank you, and uh, thank you, Nico, for this great paper. Um, some of my work is actually on expulsion events in Africa, so I was particularly interested in one line that you have about the response uh, by Tanzania after suggesting the reconciliation, which Beth also mentioned in her comments. And so I was wondering a little more detail because you have it as a sentence and then we kind of move on to some other things. But I was particularly wondering how you square Kiketwe's personal character, which you argue is committed to peace and reconciliation, but then seems to very quickly shift to retaliation and expelling the refugees when his recommendation is not well received. So how do you see that reaction fitting within his personality or is that something where the party uh, is kind of coming in and pushing that response? Thank you. We also have a question from Vladimir. So uh, we'll take that and then give you a chance to respond, Nico. Uh, hi, Nico. I just want to say I enjoyed reading the paper. Um, my comment or question is about sort of the context, because I think one of the challenges of a paper like this is that you have so much context, right? It's the childhood of the president and what's happening in the region, et cetera. Uh, but the one bit of context that I think I was missing a little bit and that I think could strengthen the paper is sort of how exactly the proposal was made by the Tanzanian president. Because uh, you mentioned that it happened at the uh, AU summit. But, and you sort of talk about it at the beginning, but you never really give us very detailed context about how exactly it took place. Was it sort of just one uh, statement that happened suddenly, or, or was it something that was sort of calculated and planned, and then the president uh, just said it? And I think the reason why that's important is because there are different aspects of you know leaders' personality. Uh, it could be that they sort of say whatever they think at any given moment. It could also be that they make provocative proposals that look like they are uh, made sort of uh, at, at, a, at a given moment, but in fact, they are actually more planned and uh, thought out. 
and so maybe giving us more context about the actual statement, about the actual suggestion, I think would, would help us uh, evaluate which one is the case. Thanks. Nico, I'll give you just a couple minutes to respond as, as you want, and then we have two more questions and we'll take those as our, our final ones. So, but I'll give you a moment to respond to those too. All right, it's always good to have your paper because uh, read, uh, it gives you very good uh, perspectives. I'd never thought of some of those issues that you raised. Uh, the one by Megan on the expulsion, uh, maybe I briefly touched on the nexus between uh, personality in the larger frame with the national character. Uh, could then that rea retaliatory reaction by Kikwete to expel uh, the refugees then could, uh, could it also be informed by the uh, larger IR discourse of realism and national interest? Probably, I don't know. I'm just trying to think it out. Maybe it could have been that. Uh, and that nexus us between national character or national interest and personality. And quickly on to Vladimir, uh, there's a very, I'd never thought of uh, okay, I tried to make an assessment on uh, the preposition, but not to that extent that you've actually proposed, which I think um, is something that I need to uh, rethink in terms of my analysis. What really informed, maybe at that particular time, um, a number of uh, factors. I think uh, th this was the time Kikwet was actually leaving office. Uh, and maybe there was also the issues of uh, trying to leave a legacy or something like that, but the rationality of that decision is something that I need to, uh, to, to, look, at, to look at it more in depth. And I thank you for that suggestion, Vladimir. Great, thanks. So we have just five minutes left, and so we have two questions or comments. The first is from Sarah Fisher. Uh, thank you. Um, Nico, thank you so much for sharing this paper. I thought it was really fascinating. Um, mine is not a question so much as a comment um, from one PhD candidate to another PhD candidate in terms of kind of pushing this forward into uh, what I assume you want to become a, a publication, right? Um, so as I was reading this, I thought like, I have the feeling this started as maybe like a term paper for a course, right. because it reads very much like that. Um, and something that I've found very difficult also is kind of turning coursework papers into publishable papers, because they're sort of written in a different way. So I think um, a little bit more um, sort of uh, evidence stuff, and I think, you know, everyone has sort of alluded to this in certain ways, um, by, by making your front matter a bit more concise and kind of consolidating um, your, your literature review and kind of like, here are all the IR theories that I've learned about in this class and this is the one I'm going to focus on, that sort of thing. Um, I think you can make that a little bit more concise and then move a lot more, kind of add a lot more bulk of like, this is why it's important for IR and foreign policy. This is the, this is the really strong evidence that I have you know, from all of these, everything that everyone has said thus far, as long as, as well as what's already in your paper, you know, you can kind of beef that up by shortening and making more concise, I think some of that, um, some of that, kind of what I call front matter, you know, like the kind of literature review stuff that you kind of feel like you have to go through that um, maybe readers in a journal don't need so much of that, you know? I don't know if, that, if that's helpful, but um, in, in moving from kind of term paper style to publication style. Thank you so much. And the other one was from Augustine. Turn the... Hi, Nico. Thanks, man. I appreciate you, man. I like your paper, by the way. Actually, I'm, I'm from Liberia. I'm doing a PhD in Orlando, Florida. But just a little suggestion for you, I mean, like I mentioned, I mean, looking at the domestic factors. You know, actually, uh, Africa international relations is actually domestic. If you look at Africa, our domestic politics is internationalized. That's a fact about Africa. But I think you need to focus a little bit on uh, some domestic indicator like transnational alliance. Because what you're discussing now is the relationship between Rwanda and the rebel. And that's a form of transnational alliance that exists in Africa in almost all region. If you can recall, even uh, Tanzania had a transnational alliance with Museveni when he was a rebel leader. I mean, even in my own country, Liberia, I mean, the Liberian leader, Chastia, that had an alliance with rebel good in several Africa. 
So you see that transnational alliance is a form of international theory that is all around Africa and across the continent. So if you can tailor your research along the transnational implication of the alliance with, uh, with foreign policy, it's going to be good. By and large, I, I wouldn't agree with David that you, you assimilate or integrate a commission. Because if you integrate commission, I mean, it becomes very blurred. The reason here is, is, I mean, how can you measure commission? And integrating commission into your theory, I mean, will be drifting to psychology, from our Arab psychology. So that's not going to fit for your research. I mean, but I suggest you stick on where you are right now. And it's a fine paper you can work on there. So I thank you. Thank you both so much. Nico, I'll give you a few minutes just to, to comment and, and respond. Okay, thank you again, Alicia. One of the things that you asked uh, me to, uh, to uh, for, for what I needed um, a lot of response and I'm getting it a lot was my methodology section. Uh, I was, I'm really grappling, I was really grappling with uh, the approach in terms of methodology. Uh, so I wanted to look at it from interviews or documentary analysis or in text uh, or textual analysis, something like that. Uh, so that is something that I think I'm partly getting a lot of answers from the paper. And that is what Sarah was trying to raise, um, maybe largely transitioning from, you know, the coursework uh, term paper to a publishable paper. This is something that I, I have. Of course, we are in the same uh, bracket as a PhD student. So I know you understand that together with also uh, Alicia as well as uh, uh, Augustine. And Augustine, thank you again uh, again for strengthening that argument, which has also been raised by Beth, about uh, the, dom the domestic factors in, in trying to mesh out uh, uh, or read in international relations, which is something that we, uh, if you look at African international relations, is something that is very pronounced. And again, Beth, I was also looking at your book, the 2018 publication with Clark. This is something that I need to also uh, maybe make um, you know, analysis and read more so that I can also enrich uh, my interest, especially in African IR. I'm actually teaching African IR this semester as a course here at USIU. We actually wrote that book because we needed it to keep teach that same course, so. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Perfect. Well, thank you all so much. So, Nico, first of all, thank you so much for sharing your paper with us. Um, we all very much enjoyed it. Um, Keith and Beth, thank you both so much for taking the time to provide comments on Nico's paper. And thank you to everyone who joined us today um, and for participating. I know there's a few other questions floating around there, but I really um, encourage you to send Nico an email and to continue this conversation offline. Um, and we, the APCG is holding summer colloquium, so I encourage you to follow us on Twitter and we'll be posting about these and to join us in the future as well. But thank you so much to everyone who joined us and I hope you all have a fantastic day and thanks so much, Nico. <laughs> right. Thanks, thank Nico. You. Thanks, Alicia. Thank you. Bye, Bye everybody. Cecilia. Thank you, Cecilia. Thank you very much. And uh, Matthias in heaven. Thank you.